Thank you, uh, Richard. It's a joy to be with you, you and Mary and the boys. And it's good to be back at uh, Deerfoot and uh, to be uh, have some more fellowship with the McCurries. Uh, through our granddaughter, Brooke, we're sort of in their family now. And uh, we're thankful for that. We've, uh, I've got some special friends with us tonight, Bill and Joyce Prentice. Bill and I grew up together, started uh, first grade together, and uh, went through high school, and, and uh, we've been close through the years. They're members at Decatur Highway, and so anytime we have the opportunity to get together, uh, we do so. And I told them that I was going to be coming over, and Richard has invited me to speak at uh, Deerfoot, and so let's have dinner together. So we, we got together with Richard and Mary and the boys and, and the apprentices, and, uh, but it is good to be with you. And thank you for inviting me on Vacation Bible School night. Uh, I love children, and uh, we're off to a wonderful start. And of course, uh, we're focusing on uh, <clears throat> strengthening our, our body members. And of course, we all realize that God has given us five senses, physical senses by which we can detect what is around us. We hear, we see, we smell, we taste, and we feel. And all of them are important or God would not have given them to us. But I'm sure that all of us would agree that sight, our eyes, are the most important. If not more important than all four, all the other four. And if you don't believe it, just ask a blind man. What is most important to you? So we're talking tonight about strengthening our eyes. You know, Jesus had a lot to say about eyes and uh, seeing and looking and beholding. And so there's a lot of material in the Word of God uh, about it, even in the words of our Lord. But when we think about strengthening our eyes, we know that uh, <clears throat> The Bible speaks not only of our physical eyes. Jesus gave sight to the blind. We know that. And his miracles were to confirm his deity. And uh, we're just moved and built up in the faith when we read of his miracles. But he also spoke of spiritual eyes or spiritual sight. So when we think about the eyes and, uh, and seeing, we have mental eyes as well. Mental eyes have to do with percep perception, uh, understanding, uh, comprehension, and uh, this is how we're able to get an education how we're able to learn because of our mental eyes. Have you ever talked with someone and uh, maybe trying to convince them of something? And uh, you say, well, look at it this way. And then after a while, well, I see what you mean. He's using those words because they have to do with our mental abilities. Well, we also have spiritual eyes. And that has to do with our comprehension of the Word of God. Comprehension of God Himself. Our comprehension of creation. Our comprehension of and our perception of God's plan of redemption. And our understanding concerning the church of the, of the Bible. And uh, <clears throat> so we understand more about our Lord when, when through our spiritual eyes. Hebrews 2 and 9, the writer says, but we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, 
for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. Now we know that those Hebrew Christians could not see Jesus. He was in heaven. Many of them, if any of them, ever saw him upon this earth in the flesh. But he said, we see Jesus. Now how do we see Jesus? How did they see Jesus? Through the gospel. Through the word of God. And so in our, with our mental and spiritual eyes, we're able to reason, understand, comprehend. We can understand the word of God. We can see God's plan for man. Now the key passage of scripture <clears throat> that we want to focus on is in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6, where <clears throat> Jesus said, beginning in verse 22, Matthew 6 and verse 22, I'm reading from the New King James, the lamp of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? He's talking about Light versus darkness. That's two different things to consider. Light, darkness. To understand this verse, we need to look at the context. We go back to verse 19. He's talking about riches. And he says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Two different types of treasure. Heavenly treasures, earthly treasures. We have to choose one or the other. We, can, we cannot lay up treasures on earth and lay up treasures in heaven at the same time. Now, of course, he's not talking about preparing for the future, saving for a rainy day, uh, getting, maybe making preparation for retirement so that you don't run out of money and cause you, yourself and your family to... He's talking about laying up treasure. He's talking about people like that rich man in Luke chapter 12. His barns were full. His crops needed to be gathered. He didn't know what to do. And so I'll tear down, tear down my barns and I'll build bigger ones. And I'll say to my soul, soul, you have much good laid up for many years. Eat, drink, be merry. And Jesus said, You're, you fool. Tonight, your soul is required of you. And then who shall those things be that you've laid up for many years? This man was laying up treasures on earth. We have people today. We don't know many of them personally that are laying up treasures. We, talk, we turn on the news and somebody is reported to be, to have billions of dollars. And uh, who, who's the richest man in the world? And this man's got 50 billion. This one has over 100 billion. People are laying up treasures on earth. Now we don't have to have a billion dollars to be guilty 
We can just be working a job day by day and it's not enough money to please us. So we work two jobs to please us. Not just to get by, not just to live, but I want to buy this, I want to buy that. I'm over my head in debt. We're laying up treasures on earth. Jesus said we need to lay up treasures in heaven. And it's either one or the other. You can't do both. How do we lay up treasures in heaven? By putting the Lord first in our life. By serving him daily. By giving of our financial prosperity on the first day of the week as Christians. Laying by in store on the the first day of the week. You know, that poor widow who put in two coins was laying up treasure in heaven. Jesus saw her do it. He also saw the wealthy give of their great abundance. But he said about this widow, she's given all more than all the others. Because she gave all she had. She was laying up treasures in heaven. It doesn't matter how much you give. Just so that you give. According to your prosperity. According to your blessings. So that goes before the verse that we are focusing on. Now look at what comes after in verse 24. He says, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one, love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is a word that's used for riches. You can't serve God and serve riches. At the same time. You can't serve two masters. Because you're going to love one, hate the other, as he said. So, what does he mean back up in verse 22? And by the way, the King James, you probably, some of you may have the King James. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. And if the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So that word single, Tells us what he's talking about. Light is so important. Our bodies is the only member of the body that provides light. Without the body, we're in, I mean, without the eye, we're we're in darkness. And you know, it's a terrible thing to be in darkness, especially total darkness. I don't know if you've ever experienced it or not. I haven't that much, but one, on one occasion, we did, uh, my wife and I <coughs> visited uh, a cave. We toured a cave. It's a large cave, large entrance. And the further we went into that cave, the darker it became. Of course, they had lights in there. And when we got into the very interior of the cave, the guide said, now everybody hold hold the hands of whoever you came with. We're going to turn out the lights. And they did. And you talk about pitch dark. 
You put your hand in front of you, you cannot see it. There's nothing. You cannot, you're afraid to take a step. Afraid you'll stumble or fall into something. It's terrible. I've heard it said that the average individual who might find himself in total darkness would lose his mind within a short time. You know, if we're in the darkness of sin, we lose our soul. And that's what he's talking about here. Now, the light of the body, the, uh, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore your eye is good or it's single, then your body's going to be full of light. It's either full of light or full of darkness. Light dispels darkness. Now, do you have good eyes? Uh, some of you wear glasses, I see. I wear glasses because my eyes aren't that good. In fact, uh, the doctors told me uh, six, seven years ago that I have glaucoma. I have to take uh, uh, <clears throat> eye drops every day, two different prescriptions. And when I went to the doctor initially and he, they examined me and put me through all of the tests and all, he said, uh, your peripheral vision in your right eye is dead. And I said, well, what can we do to make it, bring it back? He said, nothing. It's gone forever. And if, you, if it had not been caught, you would be blind in your right eye. So I'm glad that they caught it when I went for my eye exam. And uh, <clears throat> so when I close this eye and look straight ahead, I cannot see the light. I cannot see the ceiling. When I close this eye and look straight ahead, I can see the ceiling in my peripheral uh, vision. So let, and with both eyes open, the left eye makes up for the shortcoming of the right eye. There's a sermon in that, isn't it? <laughs> the left eye makes up for the shortcoming of the right eye. Bear one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. Galatians 6 and 2. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Every member of the body is important. And <clears throat> so he said, you either have a single eye, or you have good, a good eye, depending on the version, or you have an evil eye, a bad eye. Now I'm standing before you. How many of me do you see? I hope you see one. If you see two, you got a problem. Now if I hold up both hands, both arms, you f can you focus on both of them? No. If you can, if you can focus directly on both my arms, you got a problem. Our focus is on one arm at a time. Single is the word. Good is the word that we need to think about. We want to have good eyes, but how can we strengthen our eyes? 
Well, we can't strengthen our physical eye as bad as we would like to be able to strengthen our physical eye. We can't do that. You know, as we age, our eyes grow dim. We injure them. Disease develops. There's nothing we can do about it. We can aid our vision with glasses. We can aid our hearing. But we cannot strengthen either one. So our purpose tonight is to determine how we can strengthen our spiritual eye. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Our spiritual eye. What we put first in our life. And I would suggest five things very quickly in the few minutes we have left that are very important. There are many others, no doubt. There are many others. But these five are very important. Number one, we need to spend more time studying the Word of God. James 1, 25, but whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, he will be, he will be blessed in his, in his deeds. You see, the Bible teaches that the Word of God gives light. Jesus spoke much about light and showing the difference in light and darkness. We know that one of the familiar passages, John 8 and verse 12, he said, I am the light of the world. And he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. And there are different passages of Scripture. When we're reading the Word of God, we read about Jesus, who is light. We read about God. God is light, John tells us. 1 John 1, verse 5. God is light, and in Him, in him is no darkness at all. And that's why the psalmist tells us in Psalm 119, 105, your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Verse 130, the entrance of your word gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. You don't have to have a college degree to understand the Word of God. There are passages of Scripture. If you, had a, if you have a college degree, still difficult to understand, but to understand God's basic message for man. It's written so the simple, the child growing up can understand the basic principles of the Word of God. I'm afraid we don't spend enough time strengthening our spiritual vision in the Word of God and comprehending it. We talked to, I mentioned a little earlier about someone who, that you're trying to convince and you say, you look at it this way, and then after a while they say, well, I see what, what you're talking about. Wouldn't it be wonderful if more people were that open-minded when they hear the truth in our world today? When we have opportunity to study with somebody the Word of God, the basic principles of the gospel. Many people have are prejudiced 
preconceived ideas. They have their mind closed. They will not accept it. And some of them will say, well, I see that that's what it says, but I don't believe it. We, have, we need to open our minds. And the more we study the Word of God, the more we're going to see there was one church in the first century. There should be one church today. And there is one church today. God had only one plan of salvation. Not dozens. He has only one today. Now, you have to strengthen your spiritual vision in order to see it. Someone says, I never saw that before. But I see it now. I know what you're talking about. We need to spend more time daily in the Word of God to strengthen our spiritual vision. Secondly, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. What was Peter's problem when he began to sink? Walking on water. He began to look at something else. He looked at the wind and the waves. He began to write, I can drown. He took his eyes off the Lord and he began to sink. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And the Bible talks about looking to Jesus. Hebrews 12, 2. Having mentioned all of those great men and women of faith in the Old Testament, he says, we're now surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses. They've lived their life. Now we have to live our life. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Yes, we see Jesus, and we must keep on seeing Jesus, not in his, any physical form, but we see Jesus as our Lord, as our Master, as our Savior, as our Redeemer, he intercedes for us. He's our advocate. He never leaves us. He's promised, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So that we can say, Whom shall I fear? What can man do to me? Keep our eyes on Jesus. Number three. Turn in your Bible to 2 Peter chapter 1. And this is a very familiar scripture where he says, beginning in verse 5, but also for this very reason, <clears throat> And the reason is that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness that we might be <clears throat> partakers of his divine nature. And for this reason, he says in verse 5, giving all diligence, <clears throat> add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, Godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Now listen, for if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted. King James says blind. If you like these things, your shorts, you have an eye problem, spiritual eye problem. Even to blindness. 
and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. You've forgotten the past when you were baptized into Christ and all your sins were washed away? You can't think of the future as far as death, the judgment, eternity. You're nearsighted. Short-sighted. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. Now, of course, there are other things that we are to add to our faith. But if we do these things, we'll do these other things. And you take each one of these and think about it. Think about each one of them, how that they will strengthen your spiritual vision when you grow in virtue and knowledge and temperance and patience and godliness and brotherly kindness. It'll strengthen your spiritual vision and make, make you more Christ-like. Number four, we need to look at souls, at people as souls that are lost. Very quickly, let's turn over to John chapter 4. When Jesus talked to that woman at the well of Samaria, <clears throat> the disciples had gone into Sychar to buy food, and while they were away, the Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus asked for a drink, and which surprised her that a Jew would ask, have anything to do with her? They had a long conversation. They talked about worship. He pointed out her marital life. She'd had five husbands and was now living with a man that was not her husband. He talked about the water of life compared to that water that if you drink from the well, you're going to thirst again. And finally, she left her water pot. She went home. And she told her friend, come and see a man that told me everything I ever did. And no doubt she said other things to them. And they began to follow her. Verse 30 says that they went out of the city and came to him. The disciples came and encouraged him to eat. And of course he said, I have food to eat that you don't even know about. My food is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. And then he says in verse 35, Do you not say, do you not say there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Maybe this was during that time of the year, early in the year, and it's going to be about four months before the grain harvest is concerned. It is going to come forth. But what he's talking about, this woman is bringing all of her friends to Jesus. And he said, don't say what, that there are four months and then comes the harvest. Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look. Lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white to harvest. We need to lift up our eyes and look at the world about us, our friends, our neighbors. When we lived in New Zealand, on the North Shore, 
of Auckland. There's a mountain. We were there to do mission work. And occasionally we would take the day off and, and go up on that mountain and look over the city and see thousands. Auckland has over a million people, largest city in the country. But we would see thousands of homes. And then we would think, they're all souls. Lost souls. We'll never reach all of them. But maybe by God's blessing, we can reach some of them. We need to look at people as souls. What does that do? That strengthens your spiritual vision. Lastly, number five, we need to keep our eyes on our goal. That's the return of our Lord. When he will come to take the faithful home with him. And we'll live with him forevermore. Paul said looking for that blessed hope. And the glorious appearing of the great God in our Savior Jesus Christ who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself his own special people, zealous of good works. We need to look forward to the coming of our Lord. We need to look forward to heaven. Don't you look forward to that being in that place where there's no, no pain and no suffering and no sorrow, no crying, no death, as Revelation 21 and 4 describes it. Jesus said in Matthew 8 and verse 11, Many will come from the east and the west and sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven. We need to look forward to that. And if Abraham and Isaac and Jacob is going to be there, and many will be able to sit down with them, there are other special people that we can sit down with, members of our family that we've lost in death. There are preachers elders in the church that have influenced my life that I look forward to sitting down with in the kingdom of heaven. That broadens our view of heaven. It makes it more real. It strengthens our faith. It strengthens our spiritual vision our spiritual eyesight. Do I have any more time? Okay. Keep in mind, in closing, God has his, his eyes as well. He that will love life, see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no God. God, his, for his eyes are over the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. We need to broaden, strengthen our spiritual vision as we live from day to day. Thank you.